Hello, everybody. Welcome to another fun and fabulous DOD K-12 STEM Saturday. So great to be with you all. I am, as always, Professor Steve Razy. I'm a physics professor at the University of Windsor. So very pleased to be with all of you today talking about another super exciting physics topic, trying to work our way into the spring here. So I have a uh, kind of a topic that's going to be relevant to uh, people with a wide variety of interests this week. So let's go ahead and jump right in and see if you can see what the common theme are for these ideas that I want to talk about. So the topic of my title today, the title of my talk today is going to be of birds and bikes and bumpers. And you are seeing some pictures here of birds and bikes and bumpers. And what on earth might these things have in common? Hmm, I wonder. Well, let's start off with our traditional land acknowledgement statement, which I'm very pleased to be able to share with you all. I'm a representative of the University of Windsor and the University of Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa and the Potawatomi. We respect the longstanding relationships with the First Nations people in this place and the 100 mile Windsor Essex Peninsula and the Straits La Detroit of Detroit. So, as I said, I want to talk to you today about three things that seem to have nothing to do with each other, but in fact, you're going to see that they actually do. And this is something that I happen to just observe in nature. So I wanna give a big shout out to my wife for actually giving me uh, this idea of talking about this topic as we saw this occurring in nature as we are out walking around beautiful uh, Southwestern Ontario here. And of course, the reason I wanted to talk to you all about it today is because all these ideas are linked by physics. I'm a physics professor and I'm trying to tell people that when you look around you in nature, you're actually going to see physics everywhere in nature. And it's the thing that for me excites me about studying nature. And I see that it really does link a lot of the things that happen. So what do you see when you live in Canada at this time of year or in Michigan? What do you hear? What do you see? You hear this sound a lot, don't you? Yeah, that's the Canada goose. They're everywhere this time of year. And if you look up in the sky, let's turn that off. If you look up in the sky, you might see these geese as they're starting to migrate back up into Ontario or Michigan from their places that they've gone to for the winter. Canada goose is a very, very common animal here in southwestern Ontario. So I thought today we would return to our Ojibwa word of the day uh, kind of segment. And uh, today's translation comes from this wonderful website that I found. You might want to check it out, the Ojibwa People's Dictionary. Here's the uh, URL right here. You can check this out. And I have some wonderful recordings. So I thought we would learn the words for a goose. As I said, this is so common in this region. So let's learn the Ojibwa word for goose. Let's go ahead and take give a listen to that. Nika. Nika. Try that again. You can practice it at home if you want. Nika. Nika. Okay, goose. And obviously that's one goose. What about multiple geese? Let's give that a listen to. Nikug. Nikug. I think I have that right. Let's try again. Say it along as you right after you hear the word. Nikug. Nikug. Okay, so Nika, Nikug, goose or geese. So Canada geese are going to have something very important to do with the physics lesson that we want to talk about today. I wonder what that's going to be. Come back to that. Second, another thing I love to do in the summer, around about July, end of June, early July, is watch the Tour de France. And if you watch the Tour de France on TV, you're going to see bikers going down the road like this. Now, full disclosure, I'm going to talk about biking, cycling, actually, today. Uh, I am not a cyclist at all. I have known some people who do ride competitive road cycling. Uh, so I'm not speaking from experience here, but I'm going to be speaking as a physicist. And I love watching the Tour de France. I, one of the, the, it is the world's greatest uh, bicycle race. And you see them coming down these beautiful French valleys and they're in lines like this. And I started wondering, you know, what, why is it that, that the bikers are riding in these types of shapes? Hmm, might have something to do with physics. Well, we'll see about that. Third thing. Yeah, those are race cars. 
So what is it that you see when you watch a car race? So here's a bunch of cars coming into a turn at a, at a, a racetrack, and they seem to kind of be driving in a line, and they're right on each other's tail. See this car here? Right on this blue car's tail, and they're all kind of following the same line like this. wonder why they would be doing that. So whether you look up in the sky and see Canadian geese migrating, or you watching the Tour de France on TV, or you're into motor sports, and you love to watch these car races, you're going to see these phenomena. So what do they have all in common, these birds and these bikes and these really, really fast cars? What, what is it that they have uh, in common there? Well, if you're looking at the geometry of it, you might see something that looks like this. You might notice there's something about straight lines with all of these guys. These birds are flying in a straight line, aren't they? And these bicyclists are kind of biking in a straight line and these cars are in a straight line behind each other. That is not an accident. That is not a coincidence. They absolutely have something in common. They're all moving in a straight line one after another. Why? Why do they do this? The birds, the bikes, the race cars. What's going on with that? And the answer is what I wanted to talk about today. It's called aerodynamics. So to define that word kind of simply, if you've never heard it, aerodynamics is the way air moves around things. We are living in a world of air. We're breathing it. It's what makes us talk, what makes us uh, breathe, what makes us live. So we move through air. Just as you walking down the street, you are moving through air. Aerodynamics is the science or the study of how air moves around things as things move through it. Anything that moves through air, including you, reacts to aerodynamics. So it really is a science that you are experiencing every single day of your life, because every day of your life, you are moving through the air of our atmosphere and experiencing aerodynamics. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. If you guys want to know more about it, here's a great website I found on here. Again, our friends at nasa.gov, uh, a March 2017 article, What is Aerodynamics? Uh, and that's a great resource for grades five to eight. If you you really want to go a little more into depth into what aerodynamics is at your own pace, I would recommend checking out that website. So aerodynamics, as always, I like to start with where that word comes from. Uh, both parts of this word actually come from Greek roots. So we'll take the first four letters, arrow. Arrow means air. Okay, Greek for air. And if you live where I live, you uh, might see this very common arrow chocolate bar given away at Halloween all the time. So when we have our trick-or-treaters at our door, we love to give away the arrow bars. And if you wonder why on earth is it called arrow bar, but you see a picture of that chocolate, you see all those little air bubbles inside. Well, that's what arrow means. Arrow is Greek for air, and the arrow bar is a chocolate bar with all those little air bubbles throughout it. So actually, that's a very good name, good on the people from Nestle. The second part of the word is dynamic. And dynamic, it comes from a Greek root and it meaning motion, right? So aerodynamics is a study of motion of air or the motion of things through the air. Aerodynamics, air and motion, study of the motion of air around something or the study of motion of something through the air. And that's what I wanted to talk about with you today. So aerodynamics is, it, maybe you might not appreciate that it's actually a science because although you cannot see the air, it is there and it actually is quite hard to push through. So if you're just walking down the street, the next time you guys are on your way to school and you're walking down the street and if it's not windy, so I'm not talking about the wind blowing in your face, but just, although that is part of it, but just imagine on a calm day as you're walking through the air, you don't really feel the air pushing against you. The air doesn't really slow you down from walking down the sidewalk. But if you tried to run really fast, as you start to run fast, you would actually feel the air pushing against you a little bit and slowing you down. And if you're moving really, really fast, like a jet airplane, the motion of the air around that jet is really important. So here's a computer simulation of how the air is interacting with that airplane. And you can see that there's really a lot of force being exerted on the front of this plane due to the pressure of the air. Here's another computer simulation. It looks like a car company is trying to simulate the flow of air around an SUV, because that's going to be very important for the gas mileage that that car gets, whether it punches through the air easily or is big and flat and kind of has to push its way through the air. 
And then lastly, of course, over here, if you could actually see the air, this is not a simulation, this is a real picture. Uh, they have seeded the air with either smoke or dust, most likely smoke particles to make the air visible. And you can actually see the airflow around a wing. We're gonna talk about this in a little bit. This actually shows you how planes can fly. And I've talked about that in previous talks with y'all, uh, that the shape of this wing is super important that when the air rushes underneath it, it goes very, very fast and creates regions of uh, pressure on the bottom of the wing. Up on top, you get these vortices that creates these other regions of pressure, and that creates this, this force of lift above the wing and allows that wing uh, to, to allows the plane to fly by creating a force of lift. So that's all the interaction of the motion of the wing with the air aerodynamics. If you like sports and uh, as I'm recording this now, the Masters golf tournament was just on TV this last weekend. Uh, aerodynamics is important to golf as well. This is just a really fascinating video I found, uh, full credit citation down here at the bottom uh, of the screen. But this is cool that golf balls, and probably most of you have held or seen a golf ball before, they have these dimples on them. Golf balls are actually dimpled because they push through the air better than smooth balls and thus fly further. And this is really surprising because you might think you want something really smooth. So here's a very smooth ball. It's probably like a, a ping pong ball. It's the same size as this golf ball. And you would think that, oh, it's smooth. So it must like slip through the air easily, but it's not really true. This is what's called a wind tunnel test. And they're actually blowing wind around this ball. And you can see that when the dimples are present, the dimples actually break up this flow of air over the surface and it allows the air to kind of wrap around a little more quickly and it reduces the drag behind that ball. So having the dimples on that ball allow it to travel much more far through the air and it's actually really important. So if, if golf balls didn't have those dimples, even the best golfers, Tiger Woods would not be able to hit that ball as far. It's all aerodynamics because as that golf ball flies through the air, the air is moving around it and we're trying to reduce the opposition of the motion of that ball through the air and the dimples are helping do that. And you can kind of see this in this video right here where the dimples are interacting and it kind of makes the air come around a little more quickly and it breaks up this turbulent region behind it. And that's what's causing the restriction of the motion. And we're gonna talk about this all today. So the birds, the cyclists and the car, racers are all using aerodynamics to move through the air better, all right, because the birds are trying to get from A to B and use less energy, and the bike races are trying to win a race, and the car races are trying to win a race. They want to go fast. They want to go efficiently, so they're trying to move through the air better, and it, the, just the question is, is what do you mean by better? Better could mean faster in the case of the race cars. It could mean using less energy in the case of the cyclists, uh, less energy in the case of the birds who have to go a long, long distance, so the aerodynamics allow them to move the best way they can through the air. They have to move through the air. How do you do it in the best way? And that's what we want to talk about today. So let us start with the birds. So remember, we're going to talk about the birds, the bikes, and the bumpers. The BBB is coming at us this month. So first, the birds. So I told you before, we we're going to talk about wings. So this is a wind tunnel test of a wing. This is not a computer simulation. This is a real wing. This would done, be done in a scientist's laboratory. We have the air is moving from the right to the left. And it's in this, these are laminar flow lines. Uh, and they're just, they're injecting some amount of dust particles or I'm sorry, smoke particles into that wind. And it just allows you to actually see it. So most of the time you can't see the air or the wind, but in a wind tunnel, you actually can see the air. And it's important to study what it does. And you can see that here's a wing like of an airplane and it has this very particular shape. So birds and planes fly because they both have wings and the wing has this particular shape and that wing creates a force of lift that lifts them in the air against gravity. So if there were no air on earth, neither a bird nor a plane could fly. It needs the air moving around the wing, which is what you're seeing in this animation here to create this force of lift which allows uh, that plane or bird to stay up in the air. And that's all aerodynamics. But here's something 
you might not have known. So if, for those of you who knew a little bit about the force of lift, and we've talked about it before, you might have known that, but you might have not known this. If you could look at the back of that wing, kind of looking at it so the wind was coming in our face, you would see something very different. The air coming off the back of that wing actually swirls around in a circular pattern. Here, it looks like it's just going straight, but again, we would need to be looking at it from the end. And this is what it would look like from the end. You could see that that air coming out the wind actually does these little spirals like this. So you can see on this side of the wing, it's kind of spiraling counterclockwise. And on this side of the wing, kind of spiraling clockwise. And that's a circular flow of air right, coming off the backs of both wings, and we call that a vortex. Vortex is singular, vortices is plural. So off the back of the wing would be two vortices coming off the back of each wing. And so this is just a diagram that shows the creation of, they call it a trailing vortices due to a difference in pressure above and below a lifting surface. So the plane or the bird is flying through the air and the resistance of the air and the wing kind of keeps the plane in the air, but coming off the back of the wing are these vortices, these circular flows of air. And we even have a great picture of what that would actually look like. So here is a photo from NASA Langley Research Center where they're showing a plane coming through some air. And obviously now they put some red powder up in the air so you can actually see the air. Again, air is usually invisible. That's why we ignore it most of the time. You don't see it, you think it's not there, but of course it's there, it's always interacting with you. And if you could see it, a whole new world would be opened up for you. So if you see this air with this red powder, now you can see, look what's coming off the, the tail of the wing. Do you see the swirling? kind of uh, air here, swish, 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 doing this thing, right? This kind of uh, counterclockwise uh, swirling vortex right on the tip of this wing. And if we could see the other wing, it would be swirling the opposite direction. So if we're looking at the back of the plane, just like this picture, this is what it would look like coming off this, the trailing part of the wing, there's this trailing tip vortex. And in this direction, it's a trailing tip vortex that's swirling the opposite direction. What that means is right behind the plane, all the wind is going down. The wind is actually blowing from above the plane to down. We call that downwash. And on the regions of the outside of the plane, which I'm talking about here and here, all the wind or the air off the vortex is coming up. And we call that a region of upwash. All right. So simply put, this upwash, which exists on the outside of the wings, the air is moving upward. Well, if the air is moving upward and you're trying to fly, you want to fly where the air is moving up. Remember, you don't want to go down to the ground. You want to stay up in the air. So if you fly where the air is actually moving up and pushing you up, that upwash will actually help you stay in the air. And the region where the air is actually moving up is not right behind the plane, but off a little bit at some angle off the tips of those wings. All right, so take a look at this picture and see how right behind, you would not wanna fly right behind that plane because there the air is pushing you down. But if you fly at some angle off the edge of the wing, the air is actually pushing you up. I'm gonna take the same picture here and I'm gonna put it on its side. And next to it, I'm gonna put the V formation of those geese we were showing. Does that look a little bit familiar to you? Look at this, here's that V, here's that V, here's this V, Here's this V, okay? Those birds are flying in that B, V on purpose. They are flying off the wingtip of the bird in front of it. So this is like nine, they're showing nine birds in formation, a tip spacing of about one quarter of their wingspan, all right? They are flying in that region of upwash of the bird in front of them. This bird here is in the upwash of this bird. This bird here is in the upwash of that bird. And this is known that the birds at the back of the V have a slower heart rate than those in the front and they have to flap less often. They're using much less energy than the bird at the very front and the bird at the very corner here. So they're working the hardest. So all these other birds in the middle, they save a ton of energy. You might think, well, how much could that be? But you gotta remember, migrating birds fly for hundreds and thousands of miles. It takes tons of calories for them to do that. And if you're flying for 10 miles after 10 miles after 10 miles, hour after hour, all that energy adds up and those birds are really saving their energy. 
So the birds are very, very clever. And of course they know this intuitively. They have never taken a class in aerodynamics. The birds just know how to do that. And lest you feel sorry for this bird up at the front, all oh, poor bird, that bird has to work the hardest, right? Uh, all the rest are kind of drafting off him. Yes, the bird at the front works the hardest, but in this type of bird migration, one bird does not lead the whole way. Okay, so they, they do take turns. So that bird who works the hardest is eventually gonna fall back into the group somewhere and he'll get his turn to rest as well. And then somebody else will take the lead and work a little bit harder. Um, those birds are really, really clever and they understand the physics of flight uh, absolutely intuitively without ever having to be taught it. So that's pretty amazing. So just remember when you see this V formation and you will see it, and it's just the same as this V formation of the trailing vortices coming off an airplane wing. Not a coincidence. Those birds know what they're doing. And there is that V again. Do you see that? You'll, if you look up in the sky in the fall when they're flying south or in the spring when they're coming back north, you will see the shape all the time if you live around here where we see Canada geese all the time. So that was the B. Let's talk about the bikes, cycling. The cyclists in the Tour de France which is arguably the world's most famous bike race, are not flying, all right? So we're not gonna be talking about these trailing vortices off wings anymore. It's a different type of aerodynamics. They are though racing fast enough through the air and it takes a work, it takes a lot of work to push their bikes through the air. All right, so in their case, the air is providing resistance. They want to go as fast as possible through the air and the, and the air kind of acts like an impediment to it. Look at it this way. If I asked you guys to like run down the street down the sidewalk, you'd be able to sprint pretty, sprint pretty fast. But if you tried to sprint through a swimming pool, how quickly can you run on the bottom of a swimming pool? Not real fast, the water slows you down, right? You cannot run fast at all through a pool. The air is like that. You don't feel it as much, but it slows you down in the same way. It's there, and that is a critical slowing when you're a world-class athlete. Uh, how much does that air resistance slow you down? Well, if, if any race was like a mile long, it probably wouldn't matter. It slows you down a lot, but you could work at your maximum ability and push right on through that air. So I don't think it would matter all that much. But the Tour de France is not a mile long, right? The Tour de France is a race of over 2,000 miles in 23 days. 2,000 miles on bikes they ride all over the country of France. That is not a one-mile bike race at all. It is, in fact, a brutal and exhausting race. And oftentimes at the end of these races, you see riders like this just collapsed on the side of the road. They've spent every little bit of energy they can every single day, day after day after day, they push themselves to the very edge of physical collapse. It is as far as a human body can be pushed, treating it like a machine, uh, just trying to pump out the miles on those bike pedals. The energy that a cyclist at the world-class level like this can save by not having to push their way through the air can make the difference between winning that race and not even being able to finish because you'll be so exhausted. That's how important that air resistance is going to be. To you or me biking down the sidewalk, probably not at all. To these world-class athletes where seconds matter and every single calorie matters, it is all important. It's what makes the difference between a world-class champion and someone who maybe can't even finish the race. So clearly to them, this is a very, very important science. So let's talk about that air resistance. air resistance. Oh man, what a drag. Yeah, air resistance is a drag. So here's just kind of a schematic of uh, a, a cyclist and he's trying to bike from over here on the right to his left. He's moving that way. And so the air resistance is pushing against him. As that cyclist pushes the air in front of him, it builds up in front of him in red and creates a high pressure region in front of him. And it creates a low pressure depression near his back region because it's kind of sheltered behind him as he pushes through the air. And both that high pressure behind him and the low pressure on his back induces a force that slows him down that we call drag. Drag is a force that always opposes your motion through a fluid and it wants to slow you down from trying to push through it. So drag is a force that always opposes motion. 
It, it just wants to stop you from going forward. If we wanted to put an equation to it, it might look something like this. The force of drag, the force due to that air as you move through it, is equal to some constant times the square of the velocity. It means that you can't ever win against drag because the faster you go, drag builds up very, very, very much faster. If you go twice as fast, because the force of drag goes as the square of velocity, the drag force is four times bigger. If you want it to go 10 times faster, the force opposing you is 100 times bigger. You can never beat it. You can't ever win. So you just got to try to minimize it. You can't get ahead of it. You can't ignore it, but you try to minimize it. And so this thing just depends on the velocity, which is how fast you're going. But this constant then must be everything else that affects how much you uh, are, are opposed. So you need to make C as fast as possible. And of course, cyclists and their racing teams spend millions and millions of dollars trying to make this C coefficient as small as possible. They do it by having a small, very thin bike. Those bikes, when you look on them end on, have almost no spatial extent at all. It's like a piece of paper. It's so thin. So the air just goes right around it. Of course, the athletes wear form-fitting clothes that don't blow in the wind, and they wear aerodynamically designed helmets. So in this picture right here, we're seeing a cyclist who's doing a road time trial. He's wearing absolutely skin-tight suit, so the air goes over him as smoothly as possible. Look at the shape of his helmet. The shape of his helmet is designed so that when air hits him, it comes over the helmet and right down his back as smoothly as possible. He's got a bike that's as thin and as light as it can be. He's got a special wheel on the back that allows the air to flow around it and cut through the wind without drag. That's everything they've done for a time trial it's where he's cycling all by himself and that's all he can do but most of the time in a bike race you're not cycling by yourself you're cycling with other people and you can use those other people to your advantage and that's called drafting right one of the secret arts of cycle cycling uh, which is how do you draft off the people around you so there's an advantage to biking behind other people. You're gonna let the people get out in front of you and they're gonna break through that wind. You'll kind of ride in their wind shadow and there won't be as much pressure opposing you. And physicists and engineers can actually calculate what advantage this roughly gives. So here's an actual picture of a group of cyclists coming down the road. You know what it kind of looks like an inverted pyramid here. This is the way they're cycling down the road. Here's a physicist calculation, which is mapped it's trying to calculate what is the most favorable aerodynamic condition that allows you to stay close to the head of the race. You don't wanna be all the way at the back, back here, because if somebody crashes, you're probably gonna run over them. Um, you're gonna lose your advantage. If somebody makes a break from the front, you can't respond. So you gotta be near the front to keep an eye on things, but you wanna be sheltered. And so you can see these numbers in here, compared to the person at the front of the race, this person in the middle, right about here, they're expending about 9% of the energy of the total people at the front. That's a huge uh, reduction in drag. All right, so the drag is greatly reduced in these positions because they're hiding behind all those people out in front. And these are things that physicists and engineers, people who study aerodynamics, absolutely can calculate. So this is really cool because that was a simulation. Here's actually a experimental wind tunnel validation. This is cool. This is a uh, kind of a scale mock-up. These weren't, I don't think these were full-size cyclists. They might've been one quarter size, but you can see that they built that same group of cyclists and you can't see it here, but the wind is blowing over them from right to left. These guys aren't pedaling down this wind tunnel. They're stationary and you blow the wind across them in a wind tunnel. And from their measurements with the wind tunnel, they are confirming the results from that computational fluid dynamic computer model, showing that this guy in yellow right here, and you can barely see him. If you look closely, you can see there is a yellow cyclist back here, but I have a yellow arrow pointing at him just so you can see him. This identifies one of those really advantageous positions that only have five to 10% calculated drag. They are absolutely saving a ton of energy by getting tucked into the pack back there. And the cool thing about aerodynamics is it not only does it help you as you're going through the wind, it helps you with crosswinds at well as well. So when you look up in the sky and you see these geese flying like this, oftentimes you might see that one arm of that V is actually shorter than the others. Well, it turns out that the short arm of the V will tell you which way the wind is blowing at the altitude that the geese are flying.
So the short arm of the V is always on the side facing the wind. So if you see a short arm and a long arm, you know the wind is blowing in this direction, right? The, the short arm always is on the upward wind, upwind side of the V. It allows the other geese on the other side of the V to hide behind themselves from the wind. And the same is true of cyclists as well. Here's a great shot of some cyclists coming down a mountain valley, some of those valleys in, in, Paris, in France. Uh, the winds whip across the valley floor really strongly. And you can see that they're not driving, they're not cycling in a straight line, are they? They're kind of warping all over the road. And in this case, the wind is coming from our left to the right meaning from the bike rider's right. And each one of these cyclists is hiding behind each other. So they're not straight behind each other, they're offset because the wind is coming this way and they're kind of hiding behind each other like that. So this idea of the drafting works on straight ahead motion, but on these crosswinds as well. And the birds and the cyclists, the birds and the bikers both know how to use aerodynamics to hide from the wind really well. So we asked ourselves how big an effect could it really be? Same kind of question as before. Well, um, here is a picture of, that I got from uh, cyclist.co.uk uh, news. Uh, John Orney, the fastest time to cycle 100 miles while drafting. He did it in a time of two hours, 20 minutes, and 26 seconds, which is an average speed of 42.6 miles per hour. So this is an American. Uh, he attempted to set a new record category, so it's verified by Guinness. Michigan International Speedway, right near to where we are here in, in uh, southern uh, Michigan, southwestern Ontario. Uh, and he did it by sitting behind his dad who drove the minivan draft car. So here you can see this guy. I imagine he's going about 42 miles per hour. And look, he's about, what, two feet off the bumper of his dad's car. Hope his dad was a very, very good driver of that minivan. But the minivan breaks the air in front of him and he just has to tuck in behind the wind shadow, shadow of that minivan and hide himself from a wind. So how much energy did he save? Well, a lot. For reference, the world record for the fastest non-drafting 100-mile ride on a bicycle is 3 hours 11 minutes, an average of 31.4 miles per hour, showing that Orni's time, which was 2 hours 20 minutes, almost an hour faster. Almost an hour faster he could ride 100 miles. That's amazing right? From uh, three hours, 11 minutes to two hours, 20 minutes, that's about 33% uh, less time. So that's a testament to the effects of drafting when it's done properly. It's a huge amount of time, right? That's, uh, that shows the effect immediately. Clearly, if it can be done right, it's a very powerful uh, advantage that it gives one. So other studies have shown that, of course, that's hiding behind a minivan. If you're just hiding behind other cyclists, you can get drag reductions of somewhere between 27 and 50% for these cyclists who are drafting. And that difference is actually huge. If you're saving, uh, reducing drag by 27 to 50%, these riders who are drafting might expend 20 to 40% less energy. And as I said, in a race where you are exerting every calorie of energy you have to save 20 to 40% is absolutely critical. It's absolutely in, uh, really, really important. So that's called drafting and cycling, really important idea. And lest you worry about the cyclists at the front of that, don't worry, the cyclists take turns uh, doing that too. If you watch cycling at all, there's something called the Belgian tourniquet technique. And you'll see that they just kind of go in a continuous loop. There's one person at the front and he's working the hardest. He'll do it for a little while, 10, 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. He drops off, goes to the back and the next person takes their turn. He gets to rest back here. He's now using 20% less energy. He rests, he recovers. This guy's now rest and recovered. He takes the lead. He's gonna go as hard as he can until he gets tired, he'll drop out this guy who's now rested. So everybody gets a chance to lead where they're working hard. Everybody gets a chance to rest where they can recover their energy. And you can just go mile after mile after mile down the road doing this very effective technique. Now the bumpers, bikes, birds, bumpers, we said we we're gonna talk about. So in car racing, and we'll talk a lot about NASCAR today for those of you who like NASCAR racing, um, there is something called bump drafting. So bump drafting is when you tuck right in behind a car and you shield yourself from the wind. And so from everything we've been talking about before, of course, to you, that would you know come as no surprise at all. Me neither. What came as a surprise to me is in this bump drafting, both cars go faster. So as it says here, bump car, bump drafting is when one car essentially 
pushes the car in front of them so both gain speed. So what I'm showing in this video right here, and I'll try to pause it here for a second. So here's red and green. Red and green are going down the racetrack. They are both going the same speed, right? So red can't get ahead of green. Green can't get ahead, get ahead of red. That's the same speed. What's going to happen is along behind them is going to come car blue. Car blue is literally going to tuck on the bumper of car red. And it's so close that they actually touch bumpers. When that happens, they both move faster, which is surprising, and are going to pass this green car. All right, so blue car tucks in, they both gain speed, green car drops behind. So bump drafting is actually advantage to the person in front and the person in back. And that is really cool and really amazing. Let's take a look at that a little bit. To understand that, you have to think about what's happening to a car all on its own as it races down the highway. So this is a computer simulation of a car. It's obviously moving from right to left here. Say it's on the highway. In the front, you know, most cars, if you guys look at cars, they're very kind of streamlined in front. They're all kind of smooth and low and pointy and polished. So the air comes up on them and goes very smoothly over the uh, engine hood and over the windshield. And so we call that very calm air. But at the back of the car, it does not flow smoothly down through the back. You can see it's really turbulent and swirling and chaotic. It's a flow of air. It's just kind of jumbled all over the place. And all that chaotic turbulent air, again, creates lots of drag. So the fact that that is not flowing smooth, that turbulent air actually is creating drag on the back of the car, which will slow it all down. So it's not going as fast as it really could. So here's that computer animation again. And here is what bump drafting actually looks like. So here's a picture of it in the race. Here's another picture of it in the race. And note, you gotta be really, really close for this to happen, basically in contact. So considering you're going over 200 miles an hour, that's really scary to get that close to another car going 200 miles an hour, but you have to be that close. Because the idea of bump drafting is this rear car, in this case, the purple car is gonna tuck right in behind the yellow. And if it gets close enough, it fills in that low pressure region that is at the back of the car. This is this turbulent, chaotic, low pressure region. When another car is there, it can't start swirling like that, which will reduce the drag on the front car, allowing it to go faster. Of course, the purple car gets the benefit of the drafting hiding behind a car that's in front. So as the yellow car goes faster, the blue car can tuck right in behind it and it too can go faster. So this is this common technique of, of bump drafting. It takes a lot of skill, a lot of nerve and a lot of courage to get that close to another car when you're going that fast. But again, this is a physics principle. This is aerodynamics uh, in action. Right, And it can work on more than two cars. So here's another schematic I found of what would happen if three cars tried bump drafting. You had a car in front, smooth airflow over the engine and hood of this car. The yellow car gets in close enough where you don't allow the low pressure to form. It goes faster. The green car tucks right in behind the yellow car. Again, as long as it's close enough, there's no low pressure region there. And then turbulence after the third car. So three cars together, and what do you see here in this NASCAR uh, sprint series, three cars tucked together doing bump drafting. So in this case, it was Juan Pablo Montoya, uh, Kevin Harvick, and our drafting off of the Dale Earnhardt Jr. 88 car here, uh, bump drafting, All right? So this was taken uh, November, 2009 at Talladega. So again, using physics to allow their automobiles, their machines to work more efficiently. It's all physics, of course. Here's something as I was doing a little research for this talk, I found completely cool. You can use the air, the aerodynamics to slow your opponent down, which is very clever and very, very cool. And for that, I have to give a shout out to our good friends at NBC Sports uh, for this short little animation that they had on TV uh, explaining some of these NASCAR things. Really good sources of uh, sports physics out there, I would say. So watch what's gonna happen. So here's a NASCAR car, and this is just a computer simulation. It's not a model or anything, but they're, they're showing how the air is flowing around this NASCAR. So you can see that that air flows smoothly. Whoops. So remember, the more smoothly this air will flow, the faster this car will go. So that car is going well, but now look what happens. The white car is going to come up alongside of it. And as the white car comes up alongside of it, it is going to force that air coming around the black car onto its tail. And that's going to cause it to slow down. Look, they're just accenting this 
Aaron, you have to get super, super close, not right on the bumper, not right on the bumper, but right off the bumper. And this must be terrifying to drive right up on somebody and be two inches off their rear wheel going 200 plus miles an hour. But if you can do that, he's forcing the wind to actually come back into the car. It's going to hit the back of this tail, cause turbulence and slow that back car down. So watch this. You can see now the air is starting to swirl. Look at this airflow. It's creating a force of drag. And just by the positioning of this very skilled driver, he's forcing the air onto the back of that black car. He'll be able to slow this driver down, get some uh, momentum going and pass him. Uh, and that's absolutely amazing and completely clever. And I had no idea that NASCAR cars could do that. So I find that really interesting. So thank you very much to NBC for putting that animation together and teaching us all a little bit about aerodynamics. That's a great uh, public service that they're doing there. So that's awesome. So that's it, aerodynamics. As I promised you at the beginning, these things were all related, the birds, the bikes, and the bumpers related by physics. One of the points about physics and one of the things we love to study about physics is that everything in nature is usually related in one way or another because everything in our natural world follows the laws of physics, which really makes it something worth studying. And it's a lot of fun as well. Thanks everybody for listening. I enjoyed spending time with you. I look forward to talking with you next month. I hope you have a great month and we'll see you in a bit. Bye for now.